Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. I'm hanging out here in the woods and I'm looking for mushrooms and other fungal species. And what's really funny and interesting is that whenever you're looking for fungal species, sometimes you don't have to walk miles and miles and miles through the forest. Sometimes all you have to do is walk down the path, encounter a large fallen tree, and just look at it closely. And you will find literally 20 species on a single log. And that's what I found on this particular tree right here. So this is a fallen beech tree, Fagus grandifolia, the American beech tree. It's a common tree in the eastern half of North America. And at least where I live in Pennsylvania, a lot of the larger trees are dead. They've already fallen down. So they harbor a lot of fungi, a lot of different fungal species. And the reason that a lot of beech trees are dead, it involves two different organisms. It involves a scale insect that was introduced from Europe to Nova Scotia in the late 1800s. It's a sap feeding scale insect that pierces little holes in the bark and then a nectria fungus so a pathogenic organism gets in there and eventually weakens the tree and kills it so this is known as beech bark disease and it's been wiping out beech trees all over northeastern north america here in pennsylvania it was detected in the 1950s and not as many of our large beech trees still exist but you see a lot of the understory ones a lot of the younger ones because this is a common understory tree it really survives and thrives in the shade so those ones still exist but some of the larger ones including this one here succumb to both that insect and the fungal pathogen now i don't know if that fungal pathogen weakened this one because i can't see that nectary of fungus all over here but maybe it did but i'm finding other fungal species and what i want to do is introduce you to some that maybe you're familiar with maybe you're not but we're still going to have a good time we're just going to start at one end and just look around and see what fungal species we can identify so come on let's go see what we can find Okay, so I had to hop across the stream to find the first fungus for you, and it's actually colonizing this whole entire branch right here. You can see it really well, these little dots that are colonizing this branch, and I have another smaller branch to show you these little spherical globes right here. So if you find this fungus, and you're probably looking at a beech tree, because this fungus almost always grows on beech trees. So this specific specimen is Hypoxylon fragiformi, the red cushion hypoxylon. So that genus hypoxylon, that name literally means beneath wood, and it should tell you a little bit about where this fungus tends to grow. And so that genus is among the first of the fungi to colonize wood, and you'll see it on living trees, you'll also see it on dead trees. And you really see this genus in urban areas or in heavily disturbed forests, because this genus tends to colonize trees that are suffering from some kind of disease or illness or injury, whether it's due to drought, some kind of water stress, soil compaction, or some kind of mechanical injury. Now this species, Hypoxylon fragiformi, the red cushion Hypoxylon, is pretty easy to identify. First, I mentioned you want to look on beech trees, because that's where you're almost always going to find it. And then once you find it on a beech tree, look a little closer, you'll see that it's reddish or brownish in color, and they're only about half an inch wide or even smaller than that. And what's really unique is that if you look really closely, you'll see that each little specimen or each little globe is roughened with these little dots. So what are those dots? Well, they're mycologically known as osteals. These are the ends of paratesia, which are flask-shaped structures that are inside these balls. So if we would cut them open, we would see these flask-shaped structures. Within the paratesia are spores, known as ascospores. And so they're shot out of those osteals, those little porous openings at the end of the paratesia. So these little dots right here are known as osteals. Those are the pores from where the spores are shot out of these little flask-shaped structures within known as paratesia. So what's really interesting is that this fungus is actually pretty closely related to morel mushrooms because they belong to a group of fungi known as ascomycetes or ascomycata. And these fungi contain ascospores within a structure known as an ascus. So that's different from mushrooms like a oyster mushroom or a mushroom like a bluet mushroom or shiitake mushroom. Those are a little different. They don't produce spores within structures known as an ascus. They produce spores within a structure known as a basidia. But the ascomycetes, including morels and this one right here, produce spores within structures known as an ascus. Now there's one more thing I want to tell you about Hypoxylon fragiformi, and it involves its life cycle. So clearly I can see that it's acting as a saprophytic fungus because it's living on a dead tree and it's helping to break this tissue down. However, it doesn't always act as a saprophyte. Hypoxylon fragiformi begins its life as an endophytic fungus. So what does that mean? Well, it lives within the plant host asymptomatically for some of its life cycle, meaning it doesn't cause any harm. And in fact, it might actually be conferring healthy benefits by protecting the tree against water stress and protecting against pathogenic organisms, at least for some time. And so worldwide, we see that every woody plant species, every tree, every shrub, every woody plant species contains an endophytic fungal partner. And in fact, many 
woody plant species contain many endophytic fungal partners. And so the beech tree contains endophytic hypoxylon fragiformi. This fungus lives within the plant host asymptomatically in a latent phase, not doing any harm and probably conferring some benefits. However, when the tree is weakened, whenever the tree starts to die, then this turns into the saprophytic stage where then it starts to break down some of the woody tissues. So that's really interesting. Just because a fungus is listed as a saprophyte, it doesn't always have to act as a saprophyte, especially in the case of hypoxylon fragiformi, also known as the red cushion hypoxylon. Okay, so I hopped across the log to the other side of the stream again because I want to talk about this specific fungus that's growing right over here. You can see some of them jutting out from this branch. There's a couple back here. I'll show you some close-ups. And then I've got two specimens right here in my hand. So this is a polypore mushroom. Kind of looks like a boring polypore just coming up out of a beech tree. But it is exciting because it holds medicinal potential. So this one is the mustard yellow polypore. It's got a couple Latin names. It's got the name of Philinus gilvis, also Fuscoporia gilva. It all depends on which guide you're looking in, but both genera belong to the same family of mushrooms known as Hymenochitaceae. Hymenochitaceae. So let's look at those Latin names, Philinus gilvis. Philinus means corky because these mushrooms tend to have a cork-like texture to it, and then gilvis means pale yellow. And then Fuscoporia. Fusco means dark brown, and then poria is pore because the pore surface is kind of dark brown, and then gilva again means pale yellow. So where does pale yellow come from? Well, it refers to the margin of this mushroom, especially when it's young. You'll see that it's kind of yellowish all the way around the margin of the cap. Also, the interior flesh of this mushroom, when you break it off, you'll see that it's mustard yellow color. So that's the mustard yellow polypore, Philinus gilvas or Fuscoporia gilva. Now, a couple other key identifying features include the semicircular appearance of the cap, and it does not have a stem. And you usually find these in shelf-like clusters just jutting out from deciduous trees. And this mushroom acts as a parasite or a saprophyte. So it depends if you're finding this on a living tree, it could be a parasitic fungus, or if you're finding it on a dead tree, then it could be a saprophytic fungus. And it's kind of brownish in appearance, but as I said, near the end, you're gonna see that yellowish margin, especially when these mushrooms are young. As the mushroom gets older, and a lot of these are older, you're not really seeing that yellow margin. On the bottom, the pore surface is purplish brownish. It's more purplish when it's younger, but it's more brownish when it's older. And these pores are very, very, very tiny. So it's really hard to see. You almost need a hand lens to see them. Now, Philinus gilvis does have some medicinal research on it, not as much as a related species, which is Philinus lintius. So when you look at the research on Philinus mushrooms, usually Philinus lintius gets all the credit. But Philinus gilvis, the one that I'm looking at right here, or Fuscoporia gilva, does have medicinal research on it including a study that was published in 2004 in the journal Biotechnology Letters, showing that extracts had anti-inflammatory properties, specifically in the case of pulmonary or lung illnesses. Then in the year 2008, in the International Journal of Pharmacology, a study was published showing that water extracts demonstrated antibacterial properties, specifically against gram-negative bacteria. Then another recent study in 2009 published in the journal Mycoscience showed that extracts had anti-tumor properties against sarcoma. So, the mustard yellow polypore, Philinus gilvis, or Fuscoporia gilva, whatever you want to call it, it's a fascinating fungus. It's an important fungus in the ecosystem where it lives, and it also holds medicinal potential in the case of human beings. So get out there, see if you can find this. And it will grow on beech trees, but it also grow on other hardwood trees as well. Okay, so I moved farther down the beech tree, and there is so much going on in this particular section of the log right here. You can see all these little specimens right here, these crust-like fungal specimens. But you also see this pink thing right here. So what the heck is that pink thing? What are these crust-like fungal specimens? And are they associated with one another? Those are good questions. Let's just break it down one at a time and just talk about this one right here first, which is the one that I'm holding. This is a good one to know because this one is kind of like a medicinal fungus that many of us are used to finding, which is the turkey tail fungus, Trimides versicolor. But this is not the turkey tail fungus, even though it kind of looks like it. This is the infamous false turkey tail, Sterium austrea. And austrea means oyster lake, because of the appearance of the cap of this mushroom. And so this is not the turkey tail because when you just look at the underside, that's the key difference, you'll see that there are no pores on the bottom. It's just completely flat, it's completely smooth. Compare that to the true turkey tail, which is Trimides versicolor, you look on the underside of that medicinal fungus, you see that there are thousands of tiny, tiny pores, almost like somebody took a needle and just poked a bunch of holes in the bottom of that cap. But not so with the false turkey tail right here. That genus Sterium is a genus of crust fungi, 
also known as corticioid fungi, and so they don't have pores. So that corticioid grouping of mushrooms, that used to be kind of like a taxonomical classification. There used to be a family of fungi known as corticiaceae, characterized by those fungal specimens that look like paint smears on wood. However, newer research suggests that crust fungi just belong to a bunch of different families, so they don't really use that corticiaceae family anymore, but people just use it colloquially, saying, oh, that's a corticioid fungus or a crust fungus. So this is a crust fungus because in the underside you will see that it's completely smooth, almost like it's parchment paper or something like that. There's not a pore surface. That's the difference between the false turkey tail and the true turkey tail. But what's interesting about false turkey tail is that it's a fantastic white rot fungus. It has a bunch of enzymes known as lacase, manganese peroxidase, also lignin peroxidase that sufficiently break down the lignin in wood. But the ability to break down the lignin in this wood can also be applied to organopollutants in the world, including dyes. And so this mushroom is a great bioremediator as well, and it can render non-toxic a lot of the dyes that are being used in various industries, specifically in the textile industry. So this is the false turkey tail, Sterium ostrea, a crust fungus. It's very, very common. You can find it year round, but usually it's dried up like this when it's not very wet outside and hasn't been ready for many days. So this one is very, very dried out, and you'll find it overwintering as well. Now there's one more mushroom in this general vicinity. Remember, we didn't just find the false turkey tail. We talked about this pinkish looking thing right here. So what is this one? Well, this one, this pink looking fungus is known as Flebia incarnata, also known as Bisomeruleus incarnatus, depending on which field guide you are using. Now what's interesting is that this fungus, Flebia incarnata, is almost always found in association with the false turkey tail. So whenever I see it, it's almost always right next to the false turkey tail. But not always the other way around. Whenever I see false turkey tail, I don't always see Flebia incarnata. This one seems to be a little rarer, Flebia incarnata, compared to the false turkey tail. But regardless, they're usually associated with one another, though the association, the relationship between the two is unknown. I can't find anything on it, and mycologists don't seem to know the relationship either between the two species. But let's look at Flebia incarnata, the Latin name. So Flebia comes from the Greek word phleb or phleps, which means vein, and incarnata or incarnatus means flesh colored. So flesh colored because of the pink or reddish color of the cap, and then vein because on the underside, that fertile surface, it's not a pore surface, it's not completely flat, but it's kind of folded on the bottom into a pattern of veins almost. And so whenever you look at this mushroom, the key identifying features are this pinkish reddish cap surface. It's kind of spongy as well, so it's not like a polypore fungus or a bracket shelf-like fungus that's completely corky or woody. It's spongy, and the underside fertile surface has that vein or that folded surface on the bottom. And it's found in association with the false turkey tail. So that's the pink fungus right here. We also talked about the false turkey tail. Let's go see what else we can find on this fallen beech tree. So I'm going to talk about this fungus right here, this little algae-covered fungus, this polypore that's covering this log right here, because not a lot of people give it enough credit, but you will find it in many field guides, and you will find it on a lot of the walks that you're taking in the woods all year round, because it's very, very common. It kind of looks like a turkey tail fungus, but it's not the turkey tail. It might look like the false turkey tail, but it's not the false turkey tail. It might look like the violet tooth polypore, but it's not the violet tooth polypore. So I'm holding a specimen right here. This particular species is known as the mossy maize polypore, also known as Serena unicolor. It's called the mossy maize polypore. It's actually algae that's covering the cap of it. And so though it does have these concentric zones, kind of like a turkey tail fungus, you'll see a lot of green on it as well. And that's algae growth on the top of it. The key difference between all of those mushrooms that I'm talking about, you know, the false turkey tail or the violet tooth polypore or the true turkey tail is on the bottom. So this is a polypore, you will see pores but if you look at it, you don't even need to look closely. You'll see that it's kind of maze-like, or these pores are slotted. And so there's a lot of openings to them. It's kind of wide. You don't need a microscope. You don't need a hand lens. You can see them with your eyes, and it's maze-like. So that's why they call it the mossy maze polypore. And so if you would look at the violet tooth polypore, you would see teeth. You would see a violet color to the bottom of that mushroom. The true turkey tail has tiny pores that are completely white. The false turkey tail, which is actually behind me, this is the false turkey tail. Again, we already talked about it. It doesn't even have a pore surface, but the mossy maize polypore has this maze-like appearance to the pore surface. So that's what characterizes Serena unicolor. So look for it. Very common on hardwood logs and stumps. Though I'm finding it on the beech tree right now. You also find it on oaks and other deciduous trees. Okay, so there we have it. We talked about so many different fungal species on one single log. 
which is the American beech tree, Fagus grandifolia, and I only covered about a third of all the fungi that are found on this log. We would have to do a part two or part three, maybe a part four, just to cover everything that I'm seeing on here. And I encourage you to get out there and just find one single fallen tree or a stump and just stare at it, just observe it. You don't even have to be able to identify all the species. Just know that they exist. Don't forget to have an excellent time doing so because that's what it's all about just seeing what's out there observing it and just taking it all in having a good time thanks so much for watching this video truly appreciate it and i look forward to seeing you on the next one